Hello, welcome back to Clickbait. I'm Matt and I'm about to tell you one of the biggest things you can do to improve your photography right now. If you take photography seriously and want other people to take your pictures seriously as well, you should be shooting in RAW. And if you're not, why not? This is the biggest single improvement you can make to your photography. And if you're already taking digital photos and editing them, then it's basically free. Now we all start out shooting JPEGs, they are the standard default, your camera comes out of the box ready to shoot JPEG, and they're simple, they're easy, they're small, they can upload straight to social media, they're easily shared on sharing websites, um, you throw a few filters on Instagram, you're done, right? Jobs are good. No. Now sure, JPEGs are quick and easy, but the camera makes all the decisions based on an average of the white point and the exposure values across the um, sensor, and saves that as a ready-to-go image that anything can view or open. Which is great on one hand, but not so good on the other. Because it's taken the average in the moment, it's smushed all the bright and dark area information into one detailless average. So you lose your highlight sky detail and you lose your darker shadow detail. Okay, you can try and fine tune all that in Photoshop or Lightroom, give it quick curves or levels, even try a little hustle of a camera raw filter, but you're trying to push something that's not there to start with. So your blown highlights are gonna stay blown and it'll only get worse in the black pits of the shadows. They ain't gonna get grainier, really. It used to be an argument that JPEGs take up hardly any space and raw files are massive and will fill your memory cards in no time on a day out and your hard drive on the computer is gonna fill up in no time at all. But memory cards are huge and dirt cheap and so are hard disks now. So that's really not a reason to leave your camera set to that anymore. Now this is the important bit. JPEGs are what they call a lossy format. Every time you make a change and save it, you lose a bit of detail. You save it again, you lose a bit more quality again. That's not great if you're trying to put together a portfolio for a job or for a competition, or if it's your exam entry for a college course. If you value your quality over the convenience, then step right this way, sir, or madam. Now I don't know any professional photographers who don't shoot raw. I mean, apart from obviously film guys, but they're a different breed entirely. Now, anyone who wants to get the absolute best out of their images, and if you've gone to the trouble of buying a decent camera and lens, and I'm assuming this is you if you're watching this, will want to do that. So it doesn't matter if it's a second-hand camera, an old body, the cheaper end of the bodies, and even the kit lens that came with it. Even with the cheaper end of the spectrum, you can get results better than if you're shooting with something a lot more expensive by going to RAW than if that was set to a JPEG. And that's where I'm going with this. If you value detail, you need to be in raw mode. Not so you sound good on a Facebook group, but so that your pictures look as good as they actually can and you get the pictures you want and that you deserve. I assume you deserve them. Maybe you're a horrible person, in which case just stay in JPEG. Now the first thing to know is that raw images aren't actually picture files. Well, not image files as such. They're a computer data file of everything your camera sensor recorded the moment you hit that button. And that is a lot of information. When the camera saves that as a JPEG, it takes all those average middle bits and everything else in the high and the low brightness and darkness ranges and just dumps it. All those detail is gone. It's decided everything else that's outside the average middle bit is under or overexposed. That's fallen outside the JPEG dynamic range, which is really, really limited, like 256 levels. RAWs can record 16,500 levels. The worst are only about 4,000, but that's still a lot more. That information's gone forever. Now, do you want to decide what exposure was correct or let the camera do that? And then there's color depth. A JPEG can hold 16 million colors. That sounds good, right? Until you realize your camera sensor can actually see trillions of colors. And a RAW file will record all of that. And it won't set the color temperature for you either. So what do you do with all this fun-filled data? Well, here's the good bit. If you're new, and I've heard this can be quite daunting and scary, but really it's not. It's very straightforward. And here is where you take control of the images and make them what you want. Now, here's a picture I took a couple of years ago. I think it was actually on a D800. So it's a massive file with a lot of information from it. Not the newest camera in the world, but wow, that was a high quality camera back then. And honestly, it really is still a brilliant camera if you're looking for a used high res digital body. Now, what we've got here is the open RAW file in Photoshop. And these sliders down the right hand side are all the different controls and changes that you can make. Everything from color temperature through to the exposure and the real fine tuning stuff. And this is why professional photographers love raw files because you can absolutely take full control of this thing. This was shot at dusk, so we've got sun shining through the clouds, we've got deep shadows in the foreground. This is a really hard set of tonal ranges and dynamic ranges for a camera to try and capture, but I think it did it. So first of all, it's a little bit dark, so we can just, on the first most basic thing, 
bring up the exposure, just tweak that a touch, but we can bring this down again later. Nothing's fixed until you hit open image or done. Now the contrast, do we want this to be a less contrasty image? Looking a bit Instagrammy or a bit more contrast? That's too much. And you can see the red marks here where the exposure is blowing out and it does warn you of this. So I think we'll leave the, the contrast with just a tiny weeny bit more. Now, here's where things get interesting and exciting. Looking at this cloud area here, where these red marks are showing that the sun is shining through and it's just blowing the image out. We can take the highlights down until they start to drop and the whites the same. They do a very similar thing, but until we're left with a white point or a color that's within the dynamic range that the screen can reproduce, that a printer can reproduce, that's not just blowing out to pure white when there should be a little bit of color and there's just a little bit of yellow in there. If I bring them back up again, you see that's just going again. But bring it back down, there we go. And it's done that without affecting the other tonal parts. The, the greys, the darks of the picture haven't been affected by my changing just the highlights. Now we move into the shadows. This middle slider just here. We can open up just a little bit more information in this, this wall, in the side of the house. It all just opens, I can take it down if you want to just make it more moody, make it more of a silhouette, you could do that without affecting the sky because it's a little shadow detail, or bring it back up to the top. Make it way too bright, make it almost like <laughs> early morning. But now this is, this is sunset, and we want it to look sunsetty. So you know, we're gonna bring the shadows up just like two or three, just a tiny weeny bit. And that might even take the exposure back down because the exposure wasn't far off from the camera. There we go. The exposure down, but then the, uh, the shadow detail lighten that up a little bit. And you've got another correction here, blacks. So you can change the, the black point. So you can make it, it's a bit like contrast, but it's more to do with the, the color value rather than the contrast. But I might actually just leave that where it was today, because that's all about right. Now I've got three others which you can generally leave alone in most pictures. Texture, clarity, and dehaze. Now texture, if we zoom right in, it kind of adds grain, but it looks a little bit like one of the, uh, the special effects you'll get on Snapseed or Instagram, something like that. I tend to leave that alone unless I'm trying to recreate grain for a particular purpose. And there are quite a few reasons for cre creating grain and not just pretending it was a film photo. We'll come back to that another day. Now clarity, this is very much like the Unsharp Mask tool. Now the thing is, when you shoot in a RAW, it doesn't apply a sharpening filter on all cameras. Sometimes as a menu, you need to check this with your specific body to find out whether you've got any kind of Unsharp going on in there or not. So if you haven't got an Unsharp Mask, you might want to put just a little bit of sharpening on there, just like 10 maybe, just to crisp up the edges, but you might not. I mean, if your sensor, your lenses and everything else are sharp enough, and there's a great shot that just bang on, you might not need anything at all. I'm just gonna give this maybe four, just because it just crisps up those edges of the blocks. And finally, dehaze. This is kind of more useful if you've got maybe a cloudy picture, maybe there's some fog, mist, um, you're shooting into the sun, you've got like a lens flare. This can be used to accentuate that or to try and take it out. And finally, the last two, vibrance and satura saturation. This can work together to make things just a bit too much. <laughs> or you can pump one and knock down the other. I tend to find that adding a bit of saturation and knocking out the vibrance a bit tends to give you quite a nice rich image but without looking too artificial. And that's most of them. Finally, the other two you need to look at, right at the top, your color temperature. Now color temperature is a whole new ball game to be talking about, but basically it's trying to find the white point so it looks natural and different light sources have got different color temperatures. And it generally varies from blue into yellow. So we want to try and find something that looks natural. So the sky looks how it would have done in real life and the building looks how it would have done as well. Sometimes you can just tweak things to give a bit more atmosphere or sometimes you want to be as natural as possible. In this case, I think we're about right. Four and a half thousand was about natural. I'll give it a bit more yellow so it looks a bit more sunsetty. And then below that, we've got the tint. You can do more, you can do more specific um, controls of all the different colors, but this is just a general green to purple kind of shift of hue. So if you've got a scan from film, if you shot under different lighting conditions, you can really make a big difference. 
And of course, one which maybe I should have opened up with, to be honest, is your white balance. Because the camera, a digital camera, will automatically choose what light it thinks it's shooting under, or you can manually set that. If you're shooting in RAW, it will rem remember that setting, but it will record all the other options as well at the same time. So I can tell Photoshop I'm shooting under flash conditions, which is not that far off from daylight. Or I can tell it I'm shooting under fluorescent, in which case it gives us this blue tinge to kind of correct for the fluorescent colour temperature. And likewise tungsten, which will give this blue filter because tungsten has a heavy orange colour cast when you shoot under normal daylight uh, conditions as far as the camera is concerned. And so all these other things can be used as defaults but honestly, but leave it in custom and you're taking full control of the image. Now you hit open image now we have 103 megabytes of incredible image quality. This is honestly far superior to any JPEG will ever manage. We can work with this, take out defects like these marks on the sensor, fine tune the color and the light and dark, maybe if you want to levels it just to give it a little bit more. That took a little while, but you get quicker as you do it and you can soon skim through it very fast indeed. And you might be thinking, but I went out and I shot a hundred pictures today. Have I got to do that to every single one? No, don't worry, you can batch process. So if you've got a bunch of pictures that are all taken within a short time of each other, so the lighting conditions are roughly the same, the color balance, the sky is all gonna be about the same, then you can just pick up a batch and batch process them and then just go through one at a time, make fine tuning changes to different pictures as you need to. But this, this is how you take full control of your images and get the absolute most out of your pictures. If you're going to be selling your work, if you're going to be publishing it, winning competitions, this is the stuff you need to be doing. Now once you've done this, you can save it as a JPEG because you don't need to make any more changes. Once the JPEG is saved, that's fine because I have chosen which highlight and which shadow detail to dump. So I know it's the right details in there now. I can happily send this off as it is now to a stock library, to 500px, to Flickr, anywhere else like that at all, and I'll be happy with it. Well, I hope this has given you a little insight into why professional photographers and anyone serious about getting the most out of their pictures uses a, a RAW file, not a JPEG. I hope this has been helpful, and if it has, let me know down below. Thanks for watching, I'll see you again soon on Clickbait.